Uh, hello, everyone. Um, you're here with us again for a C uh, next in series of CPD in 43 with Dan Tapscott from Rapleys. Um, he'll be talking about neighbourly matters. So that's anything from right of light to um, party wall, uh, boundary disputes, etc. Uh, so you're in for a, a really interesting talk. Um, he's a specialist in the area and uh, I, thoroughly, I am thoroughly looking forward to it. Um, as you can see, um, uh, we've got an over overview coming up and as usual, please do uh, ask any questions in the chat box. We will be fielding a Q&A session towards the end of the event, but naturally, if there's something which is very specific and you'd like to receive any more detailed advice, then obviously please contact uh, Dan directly and he's more than happy to field queries and discuss this further. So without further ado, uh, Dan, I'm going to switch off my uh, video and my sound, but I will be here in the background, just make a sound and I will uh, can pop back. Great. Well, thank you very much for the introduction and good afternoon, everyone. So this is the agenda, what we're going to be going through today. Fundamentally, what are neighbourly matters? And then I'll break down the cons uh, constituent areas and I've got a working example as well at the end. So neighbourly matters. Well, this is the brief history of rat pleas, really, um, that you know, it's a nationwide practice of about 130 personnel. Um, going for about 70 odd years and Neighbourly Matters sits uh, within um, a whole plethora of other services really. Uh, we're not just a practice who concentrate purely in this area. Um, I set up the team about five years ago and uh, I'm a building surveyor by background um, and uh, I just had the opportunity to then work in this multidisciplinary practice um, and to uh, offer these services. So rights to light and daylight and sunlight amenity, and I'll obviously go through the differences between the two, are sort of your pre-construction uh, aspects uh, with neighbourly matters. And then you've got your um, post-planning construction phase um, works with party walls and access arrangements. Uh, the photo on the right-hand side there, that's the development that I was involved with. Um, very interesting one um, flanking a river um, and uh, on the other side the building that's been constructed there is overlooking a fire station who were uh, all up for the site being redeveloped and being very neighbourly uh, but when it came to the cranes um, that they said yep yeah, we're happy that you can oversail our airspace that's absolutely fine but um, can, can we just check that uh, you will definitely not be interfering with our radio signals because if you do they're coming down so um just a, a little example there of um, how wide the, the subject can go. And I was then you know, in discussions with the crane manufacturers uh, and suppliers uh, all, all about that sort of aspect to them, really. So we will start off with rights to light. So a right to light is an easement, uh, a bit like a right of way. And once um, it is associated with a building, uh, it's there pretty much forever. Um, it deals with light coming through a defined aperture. And when we say light, it is diffuse skylight. So think of it as the blue sky that we see and gets reflected within our rooms. And we measure that at the working plane, which is roughly desk height or kitchen work surface height. And um, it's a very old subject. There's a case there that talks about the amount of light to be received um, is the amount for the ordinary notions of mankind. And there is a case um, talking that the amount of light we're actually measuring is the equivalent of being able to read the Times newspaper by candlelight one foot away from the candle. So that's actually a very, very small proportion of that light. But we're measuring where that comes within the room, as I say, at the working plane. And it's all to do with what you receive after a proposal was built, not necessarily before. And if what remains um, is regarded as unreasonable, and in these rooms we, we, we plot the, the areas, and we've got what we call the grumble line. So if you step over that grumble line and you're closer to the window, then um, you potentially are leaving an unreasonable level of light um, for uh, the owner of that property. And I say the owner of the property because the rights attached to the windows um, and well, defined apertures, so it could also be glazed doors or roof lights, those rights um, 
for who can use them will depend very much on the, the leasehold arrangements and so on. <clears throat> so you can have various people who can make use of those rights to the building. Um, um, the, the remedy, if there is a, an issue, um, there are only two fundamentally, um, being um, an injunction that uh, is the ultimate one really, where the courts um, will award that saying either stop what you're doing, don't build that, or even if you've built it, take it down. So there is um, there are a few cases where those buildings were then occupied and it was a case of no, 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 you know, cut back, please. Uh, cut back to a position where you're not going to cause that unreasonable interference to those neighbours. Um, and the other remedy, of course, then is compensation. But it's not um, uh, it's not automatic that compensation would be the remedy declared by the courts at the moment. They're very much geared towards injunctions. There is talk of reform in the industry, um, but that a report was issued nearly 10 years ago by the Law Commission looking at that. Um, and uh, that, that obviously the government have had other things on their agenda over the past decade um, to really work their way through. Um, but I think it's only a matter of time until that report is going to come back. Um, so it's quite an interesting time in the industry. Now, Light like Nights is actually a new professional networking organisation that uh, myself and Ratpleys have launched. And we had our launch event last week. Um, we've got a, an online um, forum at uh, LinkedIn, just a few search for light nights. Um, uh, we've got over 200 people there. And at our first event, we had about 100 turn up. Um, and we're going to be doing regular CPDs uh, probably three times a year. We did it last week as close as possible. We could coincide with summer solstice. So we're going to be meeting at Auckland Equinox next. But um, we, we see ourselves as ambassadors to the profession, you know, meeting in the evenings. Um, and uh, a bit like the Pyramus and Thisbe Club, if you've heard of that, it's been going about 50 years, and it's for party also airs. There was no equivalent for rights to light, so that, that's an initiative we've been taking forward. I'm pleased to report the Law Commission actually attended our first event, so we are looking at the way in which the industry is developing. Um, and as well as professionals there, there are others that are related to um, uh, the industry, so there were solicitors and insurers involved and, and all sorts there. So these rights, how can they actually um, be, be granted um, to, to buildings? By far the most common is the Prescription Act from 1832. And that is for 20 years of continuous enjoyment of that light coming through that defined aperture. However, I would regard that as 19 years and one day. That's the, the number you should remember, um, because there is a way that that can be blocked um, via what's called a light obstruction notice. But that process takes a year. So at 19 years and one day, you haven't got a year left to run. And so that's the critical time period for that. So 19 years and one day or 20 is actually, you know, for buildings that we would still regard as, I suppose, fairly recent or modern construction. Uh, you know, being over in, in London last week, you know, having a look around, um, the event we held was in Bank, so lots of tall buildings around there with a lot of glazing uh, coming up to 20 years. Um, so um, it's, it's something uh, definitely to be aware of there. The other ways um, are really to do with uh, the granting of rights as parcels of land are carved up over the years. Um, so that's when we need to look through leases and um, on land registry documentation just to see whether or not there are these other relevant interests. Transfer rights to light are a huge um, area to be aware of. And this is one bit that the Law Commission, I felt in their review 10 years ago, got wrong when they were proposing to abolish um, this prescription rule of 20 years, saying, no, nope, anything that hasn't got it yet doesn't have it. That's it. However, a transfer right to light deals with where you have the coincidence in the position of the new apertures with ones that were there previously. And that right um, in, from the old windows that did enjoy that right by the Prescription Act can be transferred from one building to another. And there can be coincidence or overlapping of certain parts of the fenestration. 
So um, I think the Law Commission didn't quite get that recommendation right, and that could be a huge pitfall if their recommendations are followed. Um, uh, to give you a sort of example on that, um, it was something I uh, advised a client on saying, mm, I'm just a bit mindful here, uh, we need to do some further investigation. And um, on a building that was constructed sort of 15 years ago, and uh, in actual fact, I was able to identify that it was a car showroom there before with masses of glazing all along the ground floor. Um, so that was uh, something we had to pick our way through. Um, but there was pretty much coincidence on all the ground floor windows. Uh, abandonment is another um, key issue to look at. So I've got these examples here. So transfer rights to light. Um, this is around the corner from our, our London office. It's a fairly, the building in the middle looks to me like a fairly recent construction, but the pattern of that fenestration to me would indicate it's probably following what was there before. So yeah, that, that's one that would need checking for sure, if there was a neighbouring development. And abandonment. So it is notoriously difficult to prove that a right to light has been abandoned. You, there is case law um, to tell us that you would have to go so far as to tooth in matching brickwork and to remove uh, window sills uh, and so on. And in this picture, I would be exercising caution to treat that um, that three of those windows have been abandoned. Let's say that this building is obviously quite old, let's say you know, 100 years old, that um, there was a leasehold interest that came in 50 years ago. So uh, over the first 50 years, of course, under Prescription Act, those rights would have been granted. And then the leaseholder has made those alterations to the building. Well, at the end of the lease, their obligations, more often than not, would be for full reinstatement of the property when they hand it back. And that would include forming those windows again. So um, if you see anywhere where windows are blocked up or there's evidence of one before or even telltale signs that um, there might have been one there before or could be in the future, then just be very wary of that. So where we start off with our preliminary review, um, we I head to site, have a look from the highest vantage point, you know, often looking out for a multi-storey car park quite close. Um, go up and have a look uh, over the site to have a look, to really gauge the relationship between the site and the neighbouring uh, properties. I want to find what's on the site there at the moment or was there before if it's been cleared, you know, hopefully a, quite a big building. Um, but um, after identifying those neighbouring buildings and their various rules of thumb, we can apply for that. Uh, I'm then considering the proposals and the impact they're going to have on those neighbours and whether or not we're going to be treading over those grumble lines measured at the working plane in the rooms. Uh, I'm asking questions whether or not the design can be amended um, and how flexible things are at this point. Um, now, I bet you're all wondering why on earth is there a picture of a jelly on the screen? Uh, more of an aid memoir for me, really, that it's quite a good analogy that uh, we can actually do an analysis right from the start to give you an envelope uh, on the site. So I, I think of it as a jelly mould and say, look, if you construct within all this, you know, we've worked out the, the largest massing that could be achieved on the site without triggering injuries to the neighbours. And I totally appreciate that there'll be reasons why you might want to push beyond that envelope. You know, the planners might say, look, we want um, um, some tall massing at this particular end, we want a feature to the site, a clock tower or something like that. But it will give you that very early indication, depending if the client is happy to go down this route of trying to appease these neighbours right from the start, um, then that can be useful. So this is um, the preliminary review. We haven't got to any analysis really at this point. This is what I'm thinking when I turn up to site, if I can get sections through, We've got the subject building on the right hand side and the working plane you can see is just dotted there. We've got um, on the left hand side uh, in dotted uh, the existing building and then the proposal which is taller and closer to the subject building and the blue and red lines are the no sky line. So that's the point at which beyond that you wouldn't get that blue sky within the room at the working plane in the neighbouring property. And we can see there it um, 
I should say, the grumble line for uh, commercial properties is defined at 50% of the room receiving that light at the working plane. For residential properties, it's not defined in law, but the industry tends to regard about 55 to 60%. You might have a scenario to begin with um, where it's already um, beyond the grumble line and closer to the window. And in that instance, case law tells us that what remains is regarded as precious and therefore should be protected. So you might have um, a scenario with, say, uh, basement windows. Um, you know, quite often, Victorian properties, there's a little light well in the street. You might already have those low levels of light to begin with. So that kind of gives you your steer as to whether or not there'd be an issue. In our preliminary review, we're then, um, carrying out some due diligence. We're investigating the planning department. You know, we're not knocking on doors at all at this point um, with the neighbours. We don't, don't want to alert them to a problem if there isn't one. Um, and we don't want to prejudice our client's uh, position and the options available to deal with any issues. So we're doing a lot of sleuthing. Uh, we're there in the planning department having a look at um, room layouts uh, and arrangements, room uses uh, for the neighbouring properties. Uh, we're looking at title deeds to see if there are any restrictive covenants. So most of my advice is from the common law point of view. But if there's something in there saying, look, you can't um, construct something to this many stories on this site, then not a lot I can do about that. Um, I'm obviously mindful of uh, uh, disruptive neighbours, argumentative neighbours, anyone I should steer clear from. Um, obviously, when I'm going to site, uh, I might have a cover story. Uh, in place. Just saying that I'm there looking at party wall matters usually does it. Um, but you know, if there are any particular vocal neighbours I should be aware of, um, perhaps a competitor to the site. I've done a lot of student accommodation development over the years and uh, if there's other student accommodation next door might be in their advantage to cause you know, frustration and then knocks you out by an academic year and uh, delays a project. And I put in estate agent's details there. We all know that those aren't necessarily that reliable, but they can give some indication for us for the neighbouring properties of their arrangements. With the rights to light, though, it actually doesn't matter what the room use is. If there's an infringement, there's an infringement. It doesn't matter if it's to a, a toilet or a hall or non-habitable rooms. Um, you know, it's, it's relevant. Um, but... Um, in a negotiation, I would argue it perhaps is because you'd say, well, look, this isn't your kitchen or your living room that we're affecting. It's you know, secondary space. It's just handy to know. So I'm asking, can we amend the design at this moment? Um, I want to understand the developer's attitude to risk. Do what, they want me to go there and negotiate with the neighbours? Do they want an insurance policy? Have there been any discussions with the adjoining owners? And I've added a question mark there because that's quite crucial. You. Um, you need to keep your powder dry with rights to light. You don't want to mention it um, because um, if you do go down an insurance based route, in my experience, the insurers then won't touch it. Um, that they uh, it would steer clear from that. Section 203 of the Housing and Planning Act is uh, an incredibly important piece of legislation in terms of rights to light. If the local authority have or would be prepared to buy uh, an interest in the site, so that could only be a pound, um, possibly, then they can appropriate it for planning purposes. And so that would be for the greater good of the area, for regeneration purposes and so on. And this is how a lot of central London development has um, come forth in recent years with the local authority threatening that they would do this. And it encourages neighbours to reach an agreement, really, because uh, what it effectively does is remove the neighbour's opportunity to get injunctions. So it takes the sting out of the tail and it encourages down the negotiation route for compensation. And to a certain degree, the compensation is capped. So, as I say, a very powerful piece of legislation. And I'm always asking the question, do the council have an interest in it? And I've heard on a number of times, oh, no, no, they used to, that they sold it to us. It used to be a, a car park, but what they've actually done is grant a long leasehold interest. You know, they're still the freehold owners, so it can be very useful. Then we're um, undertaking our technical analyses, and um, 
at the top left there, we've got the uh, original building in dark green. We've got the subject properties in the light green um, that we're looking at. And in gray, we've got neighboring properties that it's relevant massing, but um, we're not actually assessing the light in there. So they might not enjoy right to light or might not have any windows, but it's still um, a relevant massing that could have a knock on effect for the level of light enjoyed by the neighbours. And then we incorporate the proposal, which is there in that dark blue. This then churns out two deliverables to us. Um, we use uh, an industry standard um, software uh, package. There's only one or two software providers out there. And you may hear of people talk about EFZ analysis. That's effective front zone. So it's where in the room is affected by the light and it weighs it up so you then get uh, a value at the end uh, in square foot. And uh, at the top there, that shows the hatched areas um, that have been affected. So there are a number of ways, you know, we're then looking at how we're going to deal with an issue. You know, wait and see, see if something happens. And in certain, in most circumstances, the neighbours have a year um, to raise their objection, their claim. Um, however, in some circumstances, it can be up to six. Um, so more often than not, um, if the developer hasn't done anything about it um, and they're about to start on site, that's when I get the call from the fund uh, and uh, the bank saying, hang on, <laughs> this, this isn't how we're going to deal with this. Thank you. Um, can, can you have a look at it? Uh, approaching the neighbours, we've spoken about. Um, uh, negotiation with the neighbours, um, that's something that is coming back. That's um, something that we haven't done for quite a while because of the, the trend towards uh, ensuring the risks. Uh, but um, of late, there's a couple of new firms who've entered the industry who um, they are basically ambulance chasers who um, specifically let drop neighbours to represent them almost on a kind of PI claim basis of no win, no fee. So that is having a huge impact on insurance premiums at the moment. So um, I have no problem in negotiating with the neighbours. It's something I used to do. <laughs> I'm keen to get back involved doing again, uh, which we are doing. Um, I mentioned about potentially changing the design to limit the risk yeah, if the uh, design is flexible uh, enough. It might just be from our analysis we identify that's just a change in parapet detail or the roof ridge height. Um, Section 203 of the Planning Act we've mentioned, and uh, insurance is the other. So, daylight and sunlight. Purely a planning issue, this. Um, and it considers the natural light received to neighbouring properties as well as proposed developments themselves. Uh, in addition to looking at the rooms inside these buildings, it also looks at external amenity space, so playgrounds and gardens for example, um, but it's habitable rooms only that we're looking inside the buildings. So um, as I said, rights to light, we'll look at everything. With your daylight and sunlight, it doesn't. Only, um, well, there are various rooms that come under the definitions of it, but habitable rooms, living rooms being prime, as are kitchens, bedrooms, less so, um, those are the main ones. So if you get a daylight and sunlight report that gives a clean bill of health, just beware because there's still risk that the client could be carrying there uh, of other rooms um, that could, there could be issues. It's a similar measure, um, the methods of assessment, but uh, that there are differences. Um, this is the guidance uh, that is the sort of the industry standard. It was actually uh, updated um, earlier on this month uh, for the first time in a decade or so. Um, so the industry is getting to grips with this and certain authorities are, are still saying, no, you can use the old, old uh, guidelines um, still for a while and others have been quite strict. Um, so this came out without much prior warning, I, I must admit. Um, but uh, our, our software provider you know, is with us on that journey at the moment. So there's um, yeah, so, some subtle changes with it. Um, 
But thankfully, right in the introduction, a paragraph remains that pretty much every Daylight and Sunlight report you ever read will probably quote, um, saying that this isn't mandatory planning policy and it's a guide and to be used and interpreted flexibly. Um, the first guide is, uh, published in 1991 had lots and lots of drawings in it that were all clearly sort of bungalows, low-rise suburban environments. And this definitely isn't where this is being applied, um, you know, city centre. So that level of flexibility you definitely need to include. This preliminary test looks similar to the one for rights to light, but there is a subtle difference. Um, the 25 degree rule, uh, and I will say I see plenty of 45 degrees, it's 25 that you need to focus on through looking at neighbouring development. It's from the centre of the lowest level window facing the development site. There is a 45 degree rule, but that is purely in relation to extensions to existing buildings. If that preliminary review indicates there is going to be a problem, then um, these are the assessments uh, as part of the BRE guide. Vertical sky, uh, looking for neighbouring properties. Vertical sky component uh, looks at the amount of daylight falling on a window. Annual probable sunlight hours measures the amount of sunlight reaching um, those windows. Daylight distribution looks similar to rights to light. Where in the room at the working plane is the light received? Um, and all those um, assessments, it's measured by a reduction factor. So it acknowledges that you can chip away at it, even if it's got atrocious levels of light to begin with. As long as you're within their 20% margin, they call it reduction factor, 0.8%. So if you take that as 80%, then you've got 20 to work with that you can chip away at. Um, and then overshadowing uh, to gardens and open spaces or sun on the ground, it's sometimes called. But this is nothing uh, to do with times of the day um, that shadows cast, although I still do see, still see those in uh, design and access statements, but um, it isn't part of the, the BRE guidance. So we're looking at um, when there will be sun reaching the ground in these external amenity spaces. Then looking at the proposal itself, and um, you, you're considering vertical sky components, so daylight to the window. Um, there was the average daylight factor, which then looked inside the room, so a bit like daylight distribution, but it then considered a weighting as to the room use, which I thought was quite logical, that um, you'd expect a, a better result in, uh, say, a living room or a kitchen than you would in a bedroom. Uh, however, that method has now been replaced and it's emerged from the European standard um, that there is now what's called the illuminance method and daylight factor method. Uh, the illuminance method in particular uses climate data. Um, so whether or not that these files are, are that up to date for this purpose yet, there's a bit of debate over that. We're also measuring annual probable sunlight hours um, that the sun will reach uh, the windows. And again, we're looking at overshadowing to the external amenity space. We're advising at this point as to the strengths and weaknesses of the rooms and the glazing and how um, these levels can be um, improved upon. There are areas of mitigation that I think are quite good to, to point out, particularly to architects and designers. Um, the mirror principle or good bad neighbour principle is outlined in the, the BRE report where um, if you have uh, a, an existing neighbouring building that is constructed tight on its boundary then the thought is that you're putting an undue onus on the neighbouring development site to appease them um, and the guide makes the, the case saying well no they should at least have um, the the same amount or equal to light and you can construct in your your model um, a, a mirror image and that becomes the baseline uh, for the results uh, which which seems fair but obviously can come out with some quite um, poor results let's say balconies is a biggie um, you 
run a test looking at um, the balconies on the neighbouring building and without, because the thought is that, uh, particularly if they're stacked one on top of the other, then to start with, that is causing a bit of harm, if you like, to the neighbouring property to begin with, and undue burden again to the de to the development site to get the light into the room when that neighbouring building itself is prohibiting that to a certain degree. Those are the main ones there. I'm just conscious of time, so I'm going to carry on. But, but, but as a brief sort of comparison there, rights to light, easements, you know, like a right of way. This is legal areas where you know, we're dealing with courts, solicitors and so on. Um, and with the remedy being that either injunction or damages. And then Section 203 of the Housing Planning Act is a, a key area to consider. Whereas with daylight and sunlight, purely a planning matter, but deals with neighbours and um, the proposals uh, itself, uh, particularly for residential properties. Uh, other, there are other uses. Um, workspaces and classrooms is another key one. And uh, there's no remedy uh, other than a judicial review. And a precautionary note at the bottom there, just remember, if your daylight and sunlight report says all is well, <clears throat> then don't forget rights to light. Um, it's surprising the number of times that I, I do have to ask that. OK, so now we're moving on to construction phase and the Party Wall Act. <clears throat> the main principle I would say about the Party Wall Act is do not forget that it is an enabling act. It's not there to prohibit or limit, impact, delay a project, but it is there to help the development get underway. And it does so um, primarily on enabling access to a neighbouring property to help get a bit of work done, to help maximise the footprint of your development site. But it's got to be done in such a way that doesn't cause undue inconvenience to the neighbour. So that sounds perfectly reasonable to me. And you need to do this um, by a notification procedure. So you're telling the neighbour, look, this is what I want to do how, why, and when, and how you're going to protect them. The first area, um, which I think is fairly underused, but quite useful in the Act, deals with the line of junction. So this means you can get tight up against your boundary. And if your footings are not what's regard a, regarded as a special foundation, in other words, I'd say reinforced concrete, now if it's just mass concrete that's poured there, then you can actually project your foundation over the boundary so you can construct tight up against it. And your neighbour cannot object to this. You just need to tell them you're going to do it at least one month before you get going. The next area um, deals with party structure, which I think most people you know, would recognise what a party wall is. You know, I, I'm in a room here and got a neighbouring office uh, next to me and so that wall is party and if I wanted to thicken it, raise it, demolish it, take support off it, cut into it, all that sort of stuff, then I've got a, a, a right I can do that even though it's shared with the other party. It's a bit like a marriage though and so there are compromises and you need to uh, inform the other party of what you're going to do and um, the act uh, recognises this is a bit more involved, so it's a minimum of two months notice that you want to do this. Um, but with all these notice periods, I would say it does depend on the number of adjoining owners you're going to deal with. Um, you might have multiple parties who, who have relevant interests. It's with anyone with a lease longer than a year left to run. So, you know, for a, a, an office that's occupied by various tenants and so on, you could have multiple parties as well as the freehold owners that you've got to serve notice on. Incidentally, though, a party structure isn't just a wall. It can also be a floor or a ceiling um, uh, between flats or offices, what have you. The next area, um, there's only this and one of the limb to this uh, section, deals with adjacent excavations and nothing to do with walls at this point. Um, if you are going to excavate within three metres of a neighbouring building and you're going below the level of their foundations, then you should serve notice. Now, you might not know for sure whether or not you're going to do that, but the guidance with the Act is if you think you may, then you should serve as a precaution. 
So you must do this at least one month before. The other limb to this is excavations within six metres. Uh, the picture there shows uh, for a basement, but more often not, than not, this would be for piling. And so, you, again, you might not know the arrangement of the adjoining owner's foundations. And it's absolutely fine to have you know, assumed layout included on any drawings. Um, but it's 45 degrees from there that if your excavation, in inverted commas, is going to bisect that line, then you need to serve notice at least one month before. Here's um, a summary of those, those areas, uh, really, in the types of scenario where party wall matters. You should be thinking, all oh, right, th these types of issue might come along. So we've got the basement excavations there, um, the extension on the line of junction, and a loft conversion cutting into a party wall or raising one. The procedure for the Act, appointment is absolutely key. You must ensure that the building owner's surveyor, so um, say that would be me acting for the developer, then you've got the adjoining owner's surveyor acting for the adjoining owners, but the building owner's surveyor must remain constant throughout. Um, and so must the building owner, it's the person letting the contract. If that were to change during the process, then potentially all those notice periods would start again, and that could cause a huge delay on a project. I've had it once, when um, I had about 20 awards altogether, and the uh, adjoining owners, uh, no, the building owner said to me, oh, can you just send that to our office in the Channel Islands? And uh, I then found out that I'd been appointed by the wrong company. But uh, various discussions with uh, adjoining owners surveyors, I managed to just about smooth that one out in time. Serving notice, um, we do that up then after we're appointed uh, to do so. And um, the notices have 14 days to run, but back to this being an enabling act, if the adjoining owners don't respond, then after 14 days, it's assumed they've dissented um, to the work and there's a dispute needing to be resolved via a party wall award. They then have a further 10 days when they can either concur in my appointment as the agreed surveyor, I then act impartially for both sides, or they can appoint their own surveyor and I agree a party wall award with them. If after those 10 days, still haven't heard, then I can make an appointment on their behalf of another surveyor, and then we agree that party wall award. So we're tracking those responses throughout the, the, the process. And when there's a dispute, that needs to be resolved. A party wall award resolves that dispute. It contains within it details of the parties, the works, any particular conditions, such as timings, uh, hours of working, uh, referring to method statements, it's all about how are these works going to be undertaken? And those surveyors are residing over that with in mind, is this causing undue inconvenience to the neighbour? We all acknowledge that development must happen, um, but there are ways and means to go about it that would limit the impact on neighbours. So once that award is agreed, it is then published and the dispute is resolved. There is then a 14 day appeal period when either party to the award can appeal it in the county court if they feel it's been made unjustly. Um, now, I've probably issued about a thousand of them by now, and I've never had that happen, touch wood. Um, but um, that is something that uh, all the relevant parties should be made aware of every time an award is published. And after those 14 days, the works can then get underway in accordance with that award. The award would also include within it details of fees, any follow-up inspections, additional information that's required um, as the work's going underway, and so on. So access arrangements. We've spoken about the Party Wall Act, that can you can gain access for works pursuant to the Act. So if you want to raise a wall, uh, reduce a chimney stack, something like that, you can gain access in your neighbour's land in order to do those works. If you don't have that, then if you're undertaking basic preservation works to your property, uh, let's say there's a leaking gutter um, that is causing dampness to come into your building and you can't access that any other way but from a neighbour's land, you could use the provisions of the Access to Neighbouring Land Act. However, if you just wanted to I know, render or paint that elevation just because it will look better, um, but you know, you, you're not suffering any damp inside or anything,
then um, your neighbor doesn't have to grant you access automatically. You would have to seek the express consent from uh, the adjoining. Now that's usually um, either a verbal agreement, which I would follow up definitely in writing, um, or a more formal access arrangement, just outlining what you're doing, uh, when and how. So these are the types of work where um, your access arrangements could come about. Uh, this picture here just illustrates an interesting scenario or, or posing a thought, really. Ignore the window looking out, but let's say that you've got the single story building at the front there. If someone was to put a vertical extension up, then those projecting eaves that are there potentially are trespassing. Um, and uh, they could be cut off if they're less than 20 years old, back to the Prescription Act we were talking about of rights to light, then um, the neighbour could extend upwards to make the best use of their site. But the developer wouldn't own those bits of projecting eaves. You'd have to give them back. It's the same sort of principle with branches overselling your boundary. Um, so the, again, those are examples of the type of licences we put in place. And so unusual ones there, like ground anchors projecting under neighbouring properties. OK, so I've just got a quick working example that uh, just sort of summarises things. This was in Bath and it was their first ever casino. Um, it was quite cunning that it was on the site of a, a bingo hall. So that's how they got the licence for it. And I was involved right the way through doing a, a preliminary review looking at all the neighbourly matters right from the outset to help maximise the development potential on the site. Um, we included doing schedules and condition on it, and latterly there are access arrangement issues with cantilevered scaffolding. Over a whole variety of neighbours, we've got a hospital there, restaurants, uh, the Comedia is a concert venue, um, there were various retail outlets and residential flats, um, which involved some key workers living there, uh, working sort of out of hours. Uh, this was the site to begin with, um, that was mainly a car park, there was also a small clinic there and a garage, and then this is what was constructed uh, in the end with some public space out the front. This image, or the one to the right, shows you with the, the, the roofs actually, the, the areas that were taken up. It was a, a former council car park, so section 203, the Housing and Planning Act, was incorporated. Um, we dealt with daylight and sunlight, obviously with various neighbours. There were 13 neighbouring properties with 29 adjoining owners that we had to serve notices throughout. And there were 38 party wall awards agreed. There were those scaffolding licences I mentioned. Uh, road improvement works, um, Bridewell Lane to the right hand side, um, pedestrianised lane actually had a colonnade underneath it. Um, yeah, there were all sorts on this site. I mean, being in Bath, the archaeological uh, works, they found a clay pipe factory uh, on it. Uh, there was all sorts going on there. So it was five years from start to completion there uh, on that project. So it sort of involved everything, really. That was my whistle stop tour that I think is in just about 43 minutes. <laughs> um, I'd welcome any questions. Perfect. Thank you so much for that, Dan. That's uh, one. I've covered um, a quite a few large areas of discussion, which probably could have their own talks standing alone. Um, but thank you very much for sort of summarising um, those. And obviously, if, if everyone is interested in having standalone talks for any of those specific areas, then please do let us know. And obviously, we can get in touch with um, Dan and uh, maybe have it catered to. Mm -hmm. Of course. Or I'm, I'm pretty sure everyone that box and we will field them. So uh, our first question is from Jack. These uh, the right with regards to the right to light. Do they only exist if an easement is entered into, i.e., on their title and deed? No, uh, not at all. Um, they don't have to be registered anywhere. Um, that right attaches to the building, not to the owner. And so that's the perspective you need to think of with it. And the most simple one is, is that building around 20 years old? Um, that's where I would start. Great. And then we've got a question in from 
Juliet, um, do you think that this will be extended to PV solar on a roof where the light being blocked has financial repercussions? I asked this question about 15 years ago and uh, no one's uh, got a, a firm answer yet. In daylight and sunlight terms, under the new guidance, um, it is included. And uh, I've been involved in a couple of times looking at that um, as to whether or not they'll be casted in shadow. Um, in terms of rights to light, um, my debate with various solicitors, we, we don't think it's, it's necessarily a right to light. It's probably a, a right to solar radiation, um, which would be slightly different. Um, but it, it, it's, I think, um, you. You don't necessarily have that defined aperture, but you have a defined frame to a panel and, you know, it only works when it's receiving that energy. And if it enjoys it for 20 years, I can foresee that um, if someone then interferes with it to an unreasonable degree, um, then, you know, there is, is recourse there for the owner of it to have it protected. So it Great. is a watch this space. I've often felt with easements um, as well, I'm, I'm not poo-pooing green technology. I'm absolutely all for it. But there are pitfalls, of course. And you know, think about um, uh, windmills or weather vanes, that um, if you were to build a large building to sort of impact that, you know, could someone say, hang on, this isn't as efficient anymore? Or rainwater harvesting would be another. If you harvested the water from a neighbouring building for over 20 years and then that neighbouring building was redeveloped, and you've all of a sudden got to plug into the mains and start paying to flush the loose. Could, could there be some sort of recourse? Not sure about that one, but you never know. Interesting. Uh, we've got. Uh, it seems like it switches to then party wall queries. So then we've got a question in from Paul. You keep freezing. See if I can see it on the chat. A section one project a foundation is only when no sorry, I don't know if you lost me there. I did, yes. Yeah, apologies. So the question is from Paul and what makes a trench found a uh, trench necessary as opposed to an offset foundation? Um, okay, so an offset foundation, you know, a sort of cantilever for construction, that'd be absolutely fine. That is one way that you could avoid using the act if you wanted. Um, you know, whether or not that would you know, increase uh, cost in terms of the design element to it and complexity, you know, you're not necessarily making best use of the site, then yeah, you, you can use that way if you want. Great. I'm having a little bit of technical difficulty, so I'm losing you and coming back in. So hopefully you've managed to answer that question. Um, yeah. We've got a question in from John. Can an annex to the award be added to the award in order to cover any or all agreements to the work subject to the Act? Mm -hmm. So um, there are what's called addendum awards, that there might be an element that changes um, just a small aspect to it. Um, that would still fall under the original notices. So those would remain valid, but the surveyors might say, actually, look, instead of using this technique, we're doing this one. Then that's fine for an addendum award to be agreed between the surveyors. Just looking at the other questions here. Do rights to light affect landing space when a joining owner claims that a side window is the only source of daylight through it? Um, yes, so the rights to light um, you know, can affect any, um, any area uh, within a property. Staircases are interesting because working out the working plane for a staircase is obviously a bit awkward. This is one of the aspects I think that should be looked at in terms of daylight and sight. They'll just come in. Um, mm -hmm. I think we've had quite a few questions, just a uh, flurry of questions come in, but I think we've only probably got time for maybe one or maybe two. Mm -hmm.
uh, for example, which is within three meters of the adjacent boundaries of neighboring properties, but it's not parallel to any structures, is a party wall notice required? I know that this is common conversation and I, I believe there's some camps in different areas on this. Um, so that'd be interesting and an interesting okay. one. So if you're constructing on the line of junction, then you'd need to serve notice, even if there is an adjacent structure next door. Um, but if you are constructing back from the boundary and there's no structure over there, and um, I, there is some debate as to whether or not, you know, a garden shed, you know, is, is structure or a patio. But I think anything with um, a foundation would be. Uh, if there's a swimming pool, yeah, that that would be a defined structure, in my opinion. Um, yeah, that sort of thing. Um, a timber fence, um, uh, if it's a driven post system, then I would say that isn't. But if it's one that is cast with footings, um, then yes, it would be. It's, it's all to do with um, that work you're going to be doing in the ground. Are you going to be affecting the immediate vicinity within those prescribed distances? Yeah, um, and then I'm just going to ask one more. Apologies to everyone that haven't managed to go through every single question, um, but obviously we have time uh, limitations. Um, so uh, let's just go with this one. So Darren, how early would you recommend uh, a client contact you before starting work to allow for admin, etc.? Um, I presume there's obviously just elaborating on, on that further, but obviously. <clears throat> If you were having suspicions that, for example, access arrangements or right to light, et cetera, were an issue or party wall were an issue, then obviously that would be a juncture to potentially even have an informal conversation. But anyway, uh, I'll leave that to you to answer. Yeah. Well, that's a great question to round off on. So thank you, Darren. But um, I would say if a client can call me saying I'm thinking about purchasing this site, then I will happily come down and walk the boundaries and go from there. And the clock does not start ticking for that in terms of my fees. It just means that uh, there are the widest number of options available to deal with issues proactively. The, the more time that goes on, and I, I hate being the one in a design team meeting, especially for architects, to say, right, we need to chop this off, move this back, change this. You know, I'm then not Mr. Popular. Um, so if if I can get in there and proactively work alongside you guys and what have you, then I think our client gets a better outcome for it. Perfect. Um, so I'm just going to reshare my screen and just run through a few of our upcoming events. So if you just bear with me, everybody. Um, uh, also, as well, as I mentioned, unfortunately, we haven't managed to go through every single question, but please feel free to contact Dan directly. He's more than happy to run through um, these with you and uh, maybe if that's a specific project you can obviously look at that in further detail if you have any more information so obviously we've got the uh, Rapley's talk from Dan up on the screen now um, so obviously thank you Dan for holding that event I hope You're everyone welcome. found that very useful and if there's if you'd like uh, sort of further talks in regards to sort of splitting any of those specific items out obviously we've done a whistle stop um, sort of 43 minute um, presentation, but any one of these could end up taking multiple days to sort of talk about at various sort of levels of uh, interest. Um, we have, don't know why it's not flicking through. Oh goodness. Okay, so I'll I'll just have to word it out then. For some reason, it's not, not flicking through our talks uh, we have upcoming. So we've just had a meet the inspector talk this morning with a joint event with CIOB and Constructing Excellent Southwest, uh, which was at Bristol Golf Club. Uh, we've got our next in the series of CPD in 43, which is UK BIM framework, which is been going to be presented by another Dan, Dan Rossiter. Um, and we've got uh, the next event, which is a face-to-face -face event, which is the our, our joint RIBA CIAT event, which will be at the JISC offices opposite St. Mary Redcliffe. Um, it's getting gear for a carbon ready future. You should start seeing on socials um, a bit of information about that and the speakers that we've um, uh, managed to uh, uh, persuade to come along and talk about these various topics from their perspective so it should be really interesting 
Following that on into August, we've got a pre presentation, which is CPD in 43 event, which will be on flood and risk management, etc. Then we've got our September event, which is from Kind Paints. October, we've got our event from Savills, which is a planning and regeneration update following on from last year's presentation they did. Then we've got a presentation in November, which is our Darren Evans, uh, which is a, uh, a achieving carbon zero talk. Uh, so that should be very interesting, sustainability consultants. And then our December talk is from Spacemaker, which is a uh, modeling software, which is allows you to fluidly and adaptively change and look at sites and see how you can build at various scales, etc. cetera. Um, so lots of feasibilities or possibilities. Um, so that's the calendar for the year. Apologies, I wasn't able to show you the, the um, posters that we've created, um, but hopefully that gives you a good un understanding of what we've got coming up and you'll start seeing them going on to our event, Bright and social media. So please do follow us on all of those. So you're staying up to date with everything. Thank you finally once again for Dan and thank you for everyone attended. This is another one of our CPD in 43 and we look forward to seeing you again soon.